So what time is it in Turkey now? We'll soon find out. It's like it Israel, no? It will be 7.30. Is the Shliach in Istanbul for some 15 years, is it already? Almost 20. Almost 20 years. Rabbi Chitrik grew up in Tzvat, in northern Israel. His parents were from the early Shluchim that the Lubavitcher Rebbe sent to Israel in 1976. And he was born there. Um, he studied at yeshivas in Israel and in America and in other places. He's a very learned man, and he runs the head of the Ashkenazic community, but his, his uh, influence is throughout all of Turkey, as well as throughout the world. Um, without any further ado, Rabbi Mendi Chitrik and the topic of life in a Muslim country, which is very much topical for this week. Shalom Aleichem, Rabbi Chitrik. You're on mute? Okay, I'm going to mute everyone. <clears throat> and then, where are we going over here? Rabbi Chitrik, we can't hear you. Are you talking? Can't hear a word. Yes, he's fine, he's fine. What's going on? Talk? Nothing. Hey, can you hear hey, me now? Now we can hear you. Now we're good. Now you can hear me, and but now I can't hear you. I don't know why. No. Okay, anyway. It's better like that. So I can't hear anybody. Nobody could interrupt me. I can go until tomorrow morning. <laughs> okay, so, um, but let me just try one more thing, so I'll see if we could get a little bit more sound here. Is this okay? Can you hear me? No. Okay. So I am, uh, the, as uh, Rabbi uh, Kievman, who has said that I'm an inspiration for many, and I don't know why he said that, because uh, he is my inspiration. Um, close to uh, 30 years ago, when I studied in Yeshiva in Manchester, and we used to go to uh, study from Rabbi Kievman, and he used to give us some words of inspiration and encouragement to learn Torah and to do some more mitzvahs and to help another Jew. Ever since I have uh, looked up to Rabbi Avrami Kievman as a source of inspiration, and I, I want to thank him for inviting me to speak to you uh, here tonight. Uh, Rabbi Kievman said, I am right now in, uh, in my car on the way from the city of Ankara, the capital of, um, of Turkey, and I'm going to Istanbul, which is probably the financial cap capital of Turkey, and also the ancient capital of Turkey. Um, the Jewish community of today, the uh, Jewish community of Turkey is mostly based in Istanbul. We have about 12 to 15,000 Jews in Istanbul and 22 active synagogues every Shabbat. One Jewish school and the uh, Jewish hospital, Jewish old age, old age home and other services that we have in Istanbul. Um, while the Jewish community of Istanbul today is mostly a Sephardic community, it's a community which came from Spain after the expulsion from Spain, from Spain in 1492 and from Portugal in 1497. Nevertheless, the Jewish community of Turkey is a very ancient Jewish community. It hasn't started 500 years ago with the expulsion of Spain. It has started more than 3,500 years ago with Avraham. Avram made his way from Ur Kasdim, which was in Iraq, all the way to the city of Haran in the Fural Crescent, about 20 kilometers from the Euphrates River. Some, today, some 20 kilometers from the Syrian border inside of Turkey. The city is still called Haran till today. I visited that city about a month and a half ago with my son. If you want to read about it, it there was a, an article came out today 
in the Forward magazine in the U.S. And, uh, and you're more than welcome to read the article. We are right about the Jewish nation that was born in what is today Turkey. Yeah. It's true that Avram was born in Iraq, and Isaac and Jacob were both born in what today is the land of Israel. But our four mothers, Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah, they were all born in Haran, what is today Turkey. 11 of 12 of the 12 tribes, 11 of the sons of Yaakov and his daughter Dina were all born in Haran while he, he came here to marry his wife, Rachel and Leah, and while he was working for his father-in-law, Laban Daramian. But eventually, Yaakov, Jacob, has moved out of Haran and moved to the land of Israel. From there, he moved to Egypt. And once we came out of Egypt, and we inherited the holy land of Israel, we have lived on our holy land for about 600 years until the destruction of the first temple. But even before that destruction of the first temple, there were already Jews living once again here in Turkey. It wasn't called Turkey then. It was called Ashur or Assyria. When Tiglath Pileser, the Assyrian king who lived then in Nineveh and Kerkamish, Nineveh is a city, in, an ancient city in Iraq, and Kerkamish, an ancient rune not far from Gaziantep, again in Turkey and the border between Syria and Turkey. Tiglat Pileser has come and has exiled 10 of the 12 tribes out of the land of Israel, and he brought them to Assyria. It's a verse that we say very often, and everybody knows the song. The Ovdim, the lost ones, will come from the land of Ashur. Where is the land of Ashur? It's right here. Here, where I'm talking to you now. This is the land of the Assyrians. And the land where Tigla Pileser, the Assyrian king, has brought over the ten lost tribes of Israel. And they were lost here. But he didn't only bring Jews. He didn't only bring the Israelites from the ten lost tribes of the northern kingdom of Israel. He also brought Jews from the southern kingdom of Judea, Jews, Jews of Jerusalem. The prophet Ovadia says that the Jews of Jerusalem, which are in Sfarad, what is Sfarad? Now, most people think today that Sfarad, Sephardic, means Spain. In ancient times, Spain was called Ispamia. That is how the Talmud calls it. The word Sepharad in that verse that says, bring the people from Sephard, the people from Sepharad will return, speaks about a city. A city in Turkey, which is called Sephardis. It's a city in Turkey called Sephardis. And somebody is busy calling me. Because, uh, oops, and there are some uh, other things coming up here. What's going on? There isn't, you know, by the way, why somebody's calling, why people are calling me now. Because we have about 450 Breslov Hasidim trying to go um, to make their way to Uman, and the Ukrainian government has shut the borders and they're sitting all in the airport here in Turkey. Some of them are trying to swim over, I think. But they need food, and yesterday we provided them with uh, some 450 salmon, smoked salmon sandwiches. Uh, we had uh, my assistant, Rabbi uh, Mendy Porush, uh, drove between all the hotels and airports, giving out food uh, to these uh, stranded people. Anyway, back to our story. Um, where were we up to? Oh, back to our story. The city of Sephardis, Sardis still has a synagogue which is about one, <clears throat> 2,000 years old. 2,000 year old synagogue still standing in the city of Sardis. 
I'm on my way, so it's a little bit difficult for me to share pictures, but maybe the, uh, the rabbi can give here some permissions. And I'll try to share some photos. It says that only the host can share. Um, I'll try to find some photos to share. It's really, really an amazing, amazing place. It's amazing to, to see that there was such a huge community 2,000 years ago and that they had a need to have such a huge synagogue. The synagogue is the size of a, of a football field. It could host up to 1,000 people. Let me see if I can get... The rabbi gave permission to share? Yeah. Yeah, you're a host. Yeah. Okay, good. I'm going to do it. Okay. Let me see. I'm going to try to get it. One second. Okay, here it is. Mm. Can you see it? This is a 2,000 year old shul. This is the Aaron Kodesh. How do we know this was the Aaron Kodesh? Because there is an inscription right on the bottom of it. It says, this is the place where the Torah scrolls are held. And where is this? It's in the city of Sepharad, ancient Sepharad, current day Sephardis. Wow. Jews have lived there for so many years. The historian Josephus writes that they, that they acquired permission to build their own synagogue. Now, everybody thought that that was just a story. But in the 1960s, this synagogue was found. It was a huge community. But there are other places in Turkey which had very, very large com Jewish communities. There was a city called um, Kayseri. Kayseri is... Um, is not far from Cappadocia. Have you ever heard of Cappadocia? Cappadocia is a wonderful, wonderful place. If you ever come to visit Turkey, you should come to see it because it has, look at this. See these natural, natural rock formations, which people lived in these rocks for hundreds of years. Jews also. The city of Cappadocia, it's still called Cappadocia today, is mentioned with this name, Cappadocia or Caputkia, about 20 times in the, in the Babylonian Talmud. Actually, the Jews of Cappadocia have an effect on almost every Jewish Shabbat table today. Because after the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem in year 68, the rabbis have gathered in the city of Yavne. And one of the most, one of the oldest rabbis, Rabbi Talfon, himself, he was a Kohen. And they were writing the laws of Shabbat. And they came to write the laws of Shabbat candles. So it says, it says the Talmud that Rabbi Talfon stood on his feet and said, Shabbat candles may only be lit using olive oil, because that's the way it was done in Jerusalem. Immediately, Rabbi Yochanan ben Nuri, another Talmudic giant, stood up on his feet and said, Maya stuan she Alexandria. What will the Jews of Alexandria do? They only have turp oil. What will the Jews of Persia do? They only have nut oil. What will the Jews of Iraq do? They have a different type of oil. And then it says, What will the Jews of Cappadocia do? They don't have any type of vegetable oil. They only have neft. Neft? Yes, fossil fuel oil. Petroleum. The first place in the world that was uh, that used petroleum was Cappadocia. And people who lived in Cappadocia used um, oil from the ground, fossil fuel oil, for, for lighting, for heating. So the Talmud says, you're right. And this is how the law was 
prescribed for eternity. And we say it, those who say this uh, Mishnah, every uh, Friday afternoon in the Sephardic rite, uh, we say it every, fr- every Friday before Shabbat. With what oil can we light? So the Mishnah says, You may light Shabbat candles with all type of oil. And the Mishnah ends, Using petroleum is kosher for Shabbat candles because of the people of Cappadocia. Today's candles, today's paraffin candles, paraffin is a byproduct of petroleum, of neft. So those Jews of Cappadocia, Jews who have lived there for 2,000 years and did not have an omelet fried in oil and did not have salad with Italian olive oil because they didn't have any oil, have some effect on every Jewish home today. Jews have lived in, in Turkey for so many years. Avram, later on, Talmudic time. Until today, Jews still live in Turkey. We live, prosper, we try to do mitzvahs, we try to learn Torah. And we're here, we're always here. Especially this week was a really historic week for Jews who live in Islamic countries. First of all, it was a great slap in the face to the BDS movement. That movement that tries to boycott or cause the West to boycott Israel. And who? Even the Arabs don't boycott Israel. So why would the Dutch government have to boycott Israel? But it also shows that really the, what seems to be today a conflict between Muslims and Jews isn't a political conflict. It's not a historical conflict. Jews have lived under Muslim rule for thousands of years. I say thousands of years because even before Islam became the, uh, the state religion in the Middle East, Jews have lived amongst these people for thousands of years. We, as a people, we suffered under Christianity much more than we suffered under Islam. So to, this week was really a, an emotional week for me, even though our government is not really supported, of, supportive of the Abraham Accords. But that's also, you know, politics come and go. We know that Jews will remain Jews and will remain Jewish if they keep to learning Torah and doing mitzvot. And uh, we could all become, uh, do one more step and do add one more thing in honor of Rosh Hashanah, which is coming just around the corner. There's a lot more to say about the Jews of Turkey, history, current state, very ancient history, because it's 2,700 years of Jewish life from the year 300 BC, during the destruction of the Northern Kingdom of Israel. All the way till today, Jews live in Turkey and practice their Judaism. Judaism is the longest served uh, religion in Turkey. Before Christians were Christians and before Muslims were Muslims, Jews were Jews, And they were practicing Judaism here in Turkey, and still do. I am uh, happy to take your questions, and then if you want to hear some more stories about the Turkish Jews. Rabbi Hitrik, before we take questions, can you just update us, tell us more about the current, the community today? What it's like in Istanbul and Turkey in general? What is the Jewish community? How do they live? What is it about? So as I said, that in, Istanbul, in Turkey today, we have about um, 15,000 Jews, we have 12,000, 14,000 Jews uh, in Istanbul, about 800 Jews in Izmir, and 200 Jews are scattered around. But of course, that's only uh, not during the, during the off season or during COVID days. In the tourist season, we have many, many more. Until about 10 years ago, we used to have about uh, 600,000 
Israelis touring Turkey every year. As you know, the famous joke about the Chabad rabbi in Nepal who met a Nepalese guy and said, how many Jews are there in the world? He said about 14 million. So the guy said, no, no, besides those that are in Nepal. <laughs> so um, we had about, you could say, we had about a half a million Jews in Turkey every year. But about um, 95% of them migrated back to Israel every year and we have about 15,000 left every year here for the winter months. The active community with the shuls, is that all in Istanbul or in other cities too? Yeah, there is a, a, another active community in, um, in Izmir. Active is, is a relative word, you know, active means a shul is open and people come and uh, there's some uh, social events. Active is a very broad term. The other, um, I actually met a Jew uh, in the city of Adana. Again, a very, very famous city in history. It's about 10 minutes drive from the city of Tarsus or ancient Tarshish. That's where the prophet Jonah that we're going to read about in uh, Yom Kippur tried to run away to. It's a port city. You want to try and board a ship going to Tarshish. Um, there's also a very famous, maybe the most famous uh, Jew from Tarshish is a guy called, uh, a guy, he's Paul, is the, uh, the one who spread uh, Christianity all over the world, right? He was Paul from Tarsus, or is it called in, in Jewish sources, Shaul HaTarsi, the Shaul from Tarsus. So I met a Jew in Tarsus, in Adana, right next to Tarsus. There are about four Jews in Tarsus. And these four Jews come every Shabbos to shul. There's no minion. But they come to shul so the shul doesn't close. It's really beautiful. And not far from there, I drove to Antioch. There's seven Jews living in Antioch. The Antioch from Antiochus, the city of Hanukkah. That's where it all started, right? So in Antioch, there are seven Jews. But you know, as Jews always tend to do, they don't really get along. But they still, some of the, you know, one guy goes on Sunday, the second guy goes Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, like they make sure the shul is open. So I met one guy, he goes to shul every morning and he says, you know, I'm not a religious guy. I'm not religious. Yeah, I come to shul. Uh, you know, uh, I put on tefillin every morning after the after shachris, I say my tehillim. I'm not a religious guy. Yeah, mincha, I do. I pray mincha, I pray mayav, I... Uh, I, uh, you know, so seven months I didn't eat any chicken because we, during COVID we couldn't get a shechet to shecht any chickens, but I'm not really religious. So I figured, you know, if this guy is not religious, what am I? <laughs> I really uh, got to find a, I have a long way to go. So, um, yeah, so we have uh, 12, 14,000 Jews in, um, in Istanbul, 800 Jews in Izmir, and a couple of Jews all over the city all over the country. And what's the situation that with anti-Semitism? Is it different, more or less than other places? How's it handled? The government won't tolerate any anti-Semitism, any open anti-Semitism. The government also actually, um, despite you know the political differences, the, the government just renovated for um, Four synagogues in Turkey. Medine, Bergama, Kilis, and uh, Gaziantep. Uh, those are names so, of cities. Yeah. So those no are Jews in those cities, but the synagogues uh, collapsed and they, they built them up. For two or three or four Jews who live there? For no Jews. <laughs> just to make sure that the, that the synagogue doesn't, you know, doesn't just get lost. They built it up. Wow. Robert Hitcher, can you tell us a bit about, you, you are the president of the Alliance of Rabbis of Is, in Islamic States. Yeah. How many Islamic I, states are there rabbis in, and how old is this alliance, and what do you do? So we have, a, it's a, the, the alliance is not very old. It was just founded just before COVID. Um, 
we came together as some rabbis from Islamic states and we said, you know, we go through similar challenges and we should have a platform where we could change ideas, try to um, help each other. So uh, we founded that alliance, but you know, COVID came up and then we had to help each other over Zoom. As uh, I heard today, today from Rabbi Mervis, Chief Rabbi of England, and he said like this, Rabot machshabot belevish, v'atzat Hashem hi takum. Men, the usual translation of this uh, verse is, in Mishle, a man has many thoughts, v'atzat Hashem hi takum, but God's idea, God's suggestion is what will happen at the end. He said like this, Rabot machshabot belevish, men can have a lot of thoughts of what should I do, what should I do? And atzat Hashem, Hashem's suggestion is, takum, get up and do something. <laughs> so that is Atzat Hashem, he, what is Atzat Hashem? Takum, yeah. get up and move your toches and do something, something positive in this world. Don't just wait for something, for, don't cry. Get up and do something. So that's a beautiful vote today. I heard, uh, I heard today from Rabbi Mervis. I don't say it over because that's my speech for, uh, for Rosh Hashanah. How many Islamic countries have rabbis? Oh, quite a few. I think about uh, 11 or 12. Really? We have, rabbis in, we have rabbis in Morocco, in Tunisia, in Turkey, in uh, Kosovo, in Albania, in Kazakhstan, Azerbaijan, uh, Kyrgyzstan, Dubai, Abu Dhabi, and Bahrain. Those North are... Cyprus. So it's about 12 or 13 uh, states or countries that have, um, have rabbis. There are others as well. They're in, uh, in Uganda and in Nigeria. So yeah, that's a, but we, we, we face similar challenges and maybe um, similar questions, similar approaches, uh, approach of the government, um, if just take the, the, the fact that our schools are all off at the same dates because of the, of the Muslim religious holidays, and he made many other things in common. So we thought it was a, an important thing to have this alliance formed. I was um, honored to be elected the first president of the alliance. And um, I hope we could help each other. A friend to, would help his friend and say chazak, say be strong to your fellow is a commandment of one of our prophets. Very interesting. We have some questions that came in, Rabbi Chitrik. For starters, it's a very Jewish question. Of course, food, very important. How, what, how is the, the communities in your country and in these Muslim countries, where do they get their supply of food? Do they get it imported from Israel, from America? How does it work? All right, so as Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Kievman knows, I'm never undernourished. <laughs> I have been uh, overnourished for many, many years. We Baruch Hashem have food. We have supply of food. Now, Turkey is the seventh largest uh, food manufacturer in the world. We actually have here kosher manufacturing that sends food all over the world, United States, to Israel. Um, there is a local shechita. We have uh, we had until COVID, we had a kosher caterer that supplied food to Turkish Airlines and every day between 600 to 4,000 kosher meals a day to Turkish Airlines. Um, yes, but sometimes if you want to have some extras, you have to schlep on your suitcase. What happens to? When we first came here 20 years ago, um, and there was no Chalab Israel, so I used to go uh, once every two weeks. There was no what? To, uh, with no, no Chalab Israel, no kosher milk. So we used to go to uh, milk a cow and, and cook, it, cook it in the house. And then, but that was, it was quite gross. My wife never touched that milk. It was very, very fatty. And smelled like the goats or the cows. <laughs> <laughs> we, knew, we knew how to pasteurize it. We didn't know how to get rid of the smell. I have a question here. Are there a lot of young people? You have a young community. We don't have a young community. We have an aging community and also the, 
the ratio between births and uh, deaths is unfortunately about three to one or four to one. So um, unfortunately, it's an aging community. But who knows? Maybe uh, I'm sure very soon or right after COVID, once they find the 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 vaccine for COVID, they'll find a special medicine to make everybody live till 224, and then we'll have a community running gun at least for another 200 years. Wow. Um, I'm being asked, what type of industries do Jews get involved with? Are they like here in the West, doctors, lawyers, and accountants? First of all, they do the traditional work of, be in, of doing the shmata business textiles so this was this is the traditional uh, um, Jewish business all over the world it has moved for some years to China and then um, a gentleman with the orange face called Donald Trump called uh, put some tariffs on China and then again the kind of Shmata business came up in Turkey so um, you know it's an interesting time to live in so they're mainly in textiles Okay. Mainly textiles, but of course, it's all across. We have some doctors, some lawyers. Um, we have uh, other investors. We have bankers. Uh, you know, like any Jewish community. Right. Right. Avrami, can yes. we ask a question? Sure, go for it. <clears throat> about, uh, good evening, Rabbi. Um, about 15, well, between 18 and 15 years ago, we used to spend quite a lot of time in Turkey. And we did visit the shul in Istanbul, and we also went to the community in Izmir. At that time, um, just about a year or so before, during that time, there had been um, bomb bombings on the synagogues. And when we were there, when we went, there, they had security, government security soldiers on guard outside for the protection of the, of the, of the Jewish congregation. Is that still the case? Um, right now, France and Belgium have taken over the government guards uh, in front of the shuls. But um, actually in Turkey, they, they look like government guards. They're paid security by the Jewish community. The government does not provide security to the okay, that's, shuls. That was, that was a question. That was a question. And um, <clears throat> when we were we spent a, a Pesach in Izmir, we got to know the people a little bit. And they were always living like, I felt they were living on the edge, always with their passports ready, never knowing quite what might happen next. Is there still that feeling? Um, I don't think I am. Um, look, I don't think this is a, uh, this is a correct description of the Jews in Turkey. Jews here have invested their lives here. But yes, um, do they feel safe? There is, a, there is an extra measure of paranoia, which I'm not really sure why. Okay. After 20 years, I still have not figured out why, because I am, my grandfather is the chief rabbi of Antwerp, and he always says that um, when he was a kid walking in the streets of Antwerp, there, were, oh, there was not spray paint, but they had graffiti and said, Jews go to Palestine. And today he walks in the streets of Antwerp and it says, Jews get out of Palestine. So he always tells me, he says, so where should we go? They told us to go. Now they told us not to go. What should we do? Now, if we take into, into uh, consideration and think about what the Jews of, say, Belgium, gone through in the past 100 years, 80% of the community was annihilated and everybody was kicked out and then came back. Some of them came back. And then look through what happened to the Jews of Turkey. Yeah, there was a bomb in 86 and a bomb in 2003. But that's the extent of it. Hmm. So I'm not really sure why is there such a paranoia. I'm in the middle of figuring out. Do, Maybe one day I'll figure it out. I do, remember, I do remember somebody saying to me that on a Friday they could hear the, from the mosque, they could hear the um, imam preaching and preaching not very nice things about the Jews. So I am not sure it goes on. But that I'm not sense. sure it is true or or just an imagination because in Turkey, until about ten years ago, 
all the speeches of the imam were pre-written by the government and the government would never write anything like that. Okay, okay. I certainly do remember one of the first time we went to Marmaris and I had never seen so many Israeli flags anywhere. The, 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 the holiday resort was just filled with them. And in the market, we walked through the market. They're so used to Israelis, they just said shalom to us. They recognized us. <laughs> Thanks, right. Marian. Yeah. Thank you okay, very much. Thank you very thank much. You, thank you. Thank Great you. questions. Um, I have some, another. I hope the Israelis in Mama has left some towels in the hotels. <laughs> very good. Um, do Jews still speak Ladino or any specific Jewish languages? Like in Europe, we have, they have Yiddish. Is there a Jewish language yes. still spoken? So that's, that's, a, that's a very good question because the, the Jews, the, of the Sephardic Jews of Turkey, spoke Ladino between themselves. However, um, 90 years ago, when Atatürk has the, founded the Republic, the new Republic of Turkey, he came up with the campaign that people should only speak Turkish. And many Jews have felt that speaking Ladino will give them a bad accent in Turkish. So they abandoned the Ladino in favor of Turkish. It didn't help much. Still, you could re if you speak Turkish well, you could recognize a Jew by his accent. But um, the young generation does not speak Ladino. It is quite interesting. I'm the rabbi of the Ashkenazi community. Nevertheless, I'm probably the last rabbi in the world that ever gave a Torah lesson. Every Tuesday night, they give a Torah lesson in Ladino. So um, Ladino. that was for the older people. It was for the older people. Until about uh, six, seven years ago, they asked me to please those older people that only spoke Ladino and are not around anymore. And we don't understand Ladino anymore. Please change the lesson to Turkish. And that's what happened. <laughs> It's just an example. It's a, it's a, you, you, you just see how things change. Want it or not, it happens. Are there any interesting customs of the Turkish Jewish community? Unique to Turkey? There are many. Oh. There are many. But I'll give you one of them. Before the Shmanes, before the, the Amida prayer every morning, everybody in the shul waves to each other Go like this yeah tourists who come to shoals they think it's really funny what do you mean everybody stands up and hello but yes you know why because the rabbis of turkey taught that before you come in front of god you have to make peace with your neighbor If you want to stand in front of Hashem and ask for good year, for good things, make sure you're in peace with the person next to you. Wow. And you know what? I once heard from a rabbi, he said, the difference between a Jew and an anti-Semite is very, very small. You know why? An anti-Semite, he hates all Jews. But he loves his Jewish doctor and his Jewish lawyer and his Jewish neighbor. A Jew is exactly the opposite. He loves all Jews. He just hates his Jewish doctor and his Jewish lawyer and his Jewish neighbor. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> so that's a wave. What are the unique customs that they got there? There are many. There are many customs. There, um, there's a custom that when the Torah comes out, the Shamash walks the Torah behind, in front of the Torah backwards to make sure to honor the Torah when it goes around the shul. There are customs of uh, hanging the arava from uh, Sukkot on the door. There are many, many customs. And, you know, we got to live in the community to really appreciate them. A friend told me, as I'm reading a question that I was sent, that a chazan is employed in every shul to daven, every service, even in the weekdays. That they have a chazan, you know, a cantor. Is that they so? don't have a cantor. It's not like somebody with a oh, voice, no. But uh, yes, um, it's sort of like this. It's, uh, it has become a very institutionalized religion. So yes, there is a, some, it, it's good and not good because that means that many people don't find the need to learn to read Hebrew 
or to express the, the prayers in the right tune and things like that, because there's a chazan, who does it? Well, maybe it's not a good idea to always have a chazan. Maybe it's a good idea to train everybody to be a potential chazan. And if you're not good today, you'll become better tomorrow. Interesting. But yes, that's an outcome. Um, in these 11 countries that you mentioned that are part of this a lot, 11 you said, right? Is 11, there, 12, are yeah. there any other movements besides Chabad in these places? In most of them, not. In many of them, yes. Right. So most not, many of them, yes. Because, for example, if you take uh, um, Kazakhstan and Azerbaijan and Uzbekistan, yes, and those, or Abu Dhabi and Bahrain, yeah, there's very, very small Jewish communities that have lived there and survived there for many years, but not, uh, not much else. But here in Turkey, we have, uh, we have Chabad also, but it's um, mostly the Turkish Jewish community, which is strong. Hmm. Um, can you tell us first a two two part question? Have you had has Turkey had a lockdown as uh, many other countries have had? And secondly, can you describe to us how the upcoming Yom Nairoim are going to be in your community? Um, I'll start with the second part. I don't want to describe it because it's too sad. I was actually in the states and I arrived here on Sunday. And as I uh, Monday and as I landed, I get a note that the shul is going to be closed for Rosh Hashanah. So, really, not sure how that's going to work shul, out. all the shuls, all the shuls. So I'm not really sure what's going to happen. So that's that's one thing. And yes, we had the lockdown, a severe lockdown. We were three months locked up in the house. Kids were not allowed to walk out. We we're only allowed to walk out to get some to get supplies. It was uh, quite difficult. Kids were only allowed after three months to go out once a week on Wednesdays between one and six. Did the lockdown help anything? The lockdown helped to cover up what's really going on. <laughs> so as it stands today, there will not be any shuls, any davening in shuls over Rosh Hashanah. That's what I don't know. I don't know. It, things change every day. Is that a government decision or a community decision? It's a, it's a community decision because the government has opened up the economy. All hotels are open. Stores are all open. But um, we suffered 20 dead people in our community, including a chazan, a weekday chazan and a Shabbos chazan. Um, a dear friend of mine who uh, I davened with every single uh, Shabbos. And he passed away at the age of 55. And uh, other people, we lost about 20 people in our community. So hmm. it's an aging community. So that's another reason why to be worried. So I don't know the climate. We know that, we know that life comes before anything else. So it's a bigger mitzvah to save life than to attend shul, even on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Is there no possibility? I don't know what the climate is like. Is there no possibility for services outdoors? There is a possibility. Um, I think only five people registered. <laughs> Does the organization have any relationship with exile to exiled communities, for instance, those of Algeria and Iraq? No. There's nothing. No, we don't have any. We, our motto of our organization, Alliance of Rabbis in Islamic States is not the exiled communities and not the satellite communities. It's about promoting Jewish life in Islamic countries. Because when people speak about tolerance, coexistence, peace, and all they demonstrate peace is because from time to time they go to meet an imam and take pictures and put in the newspapers or go to a conference and say, oh, peace and tolerance. That's not real peace and tolerance. Real peace and tolerance is Live in it and live like a Jew and don't hide your Judaism. Live like a Jew in the Islamic state and then you gain the respect of your neighbors. This is tolerance. This is coexistence. This is peace. And you're comfortable. So that's why we don't have an aim to, uh, to connect to, uh, to a Jewish you know, organization to come to uh, dialogue meetings and all these, you know, blah, 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 blah. Jewish life in Islamic states. 
and you and your so. children are comfortable to walk in the streets of Istanbul with a keeper on your head? Yep. Never had any incident walking with it. I had an incident with the keeper when I once landed in Paris and somebody stole my keeper in the airport. <laughs> Talking of your children. Or when I studied in Manchester and people used to scream at us, dirty Jew and things like that. But in Istanbul, never had anything. <laughs> Talking of your children, do you have schools? Are there schools in the community? How do you educate your children? So there is a Jewish school, but I like to call it a school for Jews. <laughs> so what do you it's do? A, it's a very secularized Jewish school because it was founded by the um, Alliance Israelit uh, organization about 120 years ago in a very very with very secular terms and I uh, blame not the school today because it's not their fault but I blame the founders of this uh, school for the uh, destruction of the Jewish community of the spirit of the Jewish community because they have taken away the heart or the neshama from practicing Judaism and made it into a, you know, eating gefilte fish Judaism. That doesn't help. So here we don't have gefilte fish. That's an Ashkenazi food. That's actually quite disgusting. You think about it, sugar and fish. But <laughs> we eat here uh, other foods, borikita, pandispania, etc. But that's not all about Judaism. I always tell people when they speak about, oh, Sephardic heritage. Sephardic her heritage doesn't mean you're going to speak Ladino and eat some burekas and say, whoa, Sephardic heritage. Sephardic heritage is by studying the books of Maimonides and following the way of the Torah, the way the Sephardic rabbis have taught us. It's a very, very big difference between. So how do you educate your children if you want them to have a proper Jewish education? In Istanbul. So it's mostly done at home because okay. education starts at home. You know, there was once a rabbi, his name was Rabbi Chaim of Olozhin, and he met the Russian minister of education who asked him, Rabbi, when does Jewish education start? The age of five, the age of 15, 20. When do you just start Jewish education? You know, the rabbi said, the rabbi said the Jewish education starts 20 years before a child is born. <laughs> 20 years before a child is born, that is when Jewish education starts. Because if you want your children to be ed Jewishly educated, you've got to educate yourself. Oh. Fascinating. Well, if anyone else has any more questions, please, you can unmute yourselves. Otherwise, we will uh, say goodbye and good night to Rabbi Chitrik. If, God forbid, the uh, shuls won't open, there'll always be place for you here in Liverpool. I'm an American citizen, and I'm not allowed into the United Kingdom these days. Americans are allowed. Of course you're allowed. Uh, uh, uh. That doesn't change. Americans are allowed. You'll be only, allowed. Only, only if you have a residence. I don't think so. You, uh, mm -hmm. You're sure. You checked. You already looked at your options. <laughs> well, we, we, we may just find a solution. We have a few days. Let us know that you're okay. interested. We'll find, you know, visiting rabbi, scholar in residence. We'd love to have you in Liverpool. Scholar in residence, actually, is not the new phenomenon. You know that? The Talmud says that, I mentioned before, the city of Cappadocia, the Talmud says that one day Rabbi Akiva was traveling from Israel to Cappadocia. And on the way, he met, for the first time, his student, Rabbi Meir. And the boat capsized. And Rabbi Akiva was sure that Rabbi Meir passed away and died, drowned in the sea. And says Rabbi Akiva, when I came to Cappadocia, I saw that Rabbi Meir was also saved. And he sat at my, at my lecture while I was in Cappadocia. So traveling scholars is an old thing. Started in Cappadocia 2,000 years ago. Fantastic. We admire your positive approach and uh, your confidence, and we bless you that not just you, but together with the other Islamic countries, we should be able to have that tranquility, as you say, to be able to live in peace without going all these years without any uh, attacks or anything. It's fantastic to hear. We wish you all the best. Bless us for a good year. 
speak a bit of Ladino and bless us all in Liverpool for a good year. Please. Everybody should have a good year. Ktiva b'chatima tova. Anios y buenos. Muchos y largos. Many good good years. Many healthy years. Sanyo y rezio. And only good. And we'll finish with one Ladino song. Cuando el rey Nimrod al campo salía, miraba en el cielo, en la estería, mira luz santa en la judería que había de nacer. Abraham vino, Abraham vino, Padre querido, Padre bendito, luz de Israel. Abraham vino, Padre querido, Padre bendito, luz de Israel. La mujer de tierra quedó preñada. Día en día él la preguntaba de qué tenés la cara tan demudada. Ella ya sabía el bien que tenía. Abraham vino, Padre querido, Padre bendito, luz de Israel. Abraham vino, Padre querido, Padre bendito, luz de Israel. Okay, that's beautiful. What does it mean? Avraham Avinu, Avraham our father, Abraham our father, Padre querido, beloved father, Padre bendito, blessed father, Luz de Israel, the light of Israel. <laughs> We've heard that tune at Simchas. I never knew the words. Okay, now you know. You have time to Rosh Hashanah to practice, and then okay. in the morning you could, t- you could <laughs> teach all the congregants. Thank you very much, everybody, for listening and have all the all the best. I still have uh, two more hours to drive home. So uh, I'll leave you have a day. safe trip. Thank you. Stay awake. Have a Maxima Maxima Teva, Lashana Teva Masuka to you, to the community in Istanbul and in all of Turkey, and to all of us here in Liverpool. May it be a great, happy, healthy, and sweet year. Have a good night. See you until Sukis. <laughs> oh, man. Thank you. <laughs> I want to thank my colleagues, Rabbi Fagelman and Rabbi Avinoam, for putting it together, the three of us putting these wonderful nights together. We had wonderful crowds every night with a beautiful variety and selection of speakers. And uh, we hopefully will be able to put on more of these every so often. Just to remind everyone, we are having, we, we put together these wonderful Rosh Hashanah toolboxes for the children. And there's still a bit of supply left. Tomorrow is the collection day. If you have any children or grandchildren, feel free. Don't hesitate. Send us a message or book online. And they'll get these beautiful Rosh Hashanah packages with a lot of activities to do, to eat, to read, to play, to do crafts. There's a lot of good stuff there. Have a great Yom Tov, everybody, and a Shana Tova. And we'll see you Thank all you. soon. Bye-bye.